I was talking to a friend the other day, and he basically said to me that, so he knows what I say to him, listen, we're 35 years old, we have 30 years, who cares where the market goes? Obviously, you know, I'm not minimizing it. I, I don't hope the market goes a lot lower. But it, my point was, if our destination is 30 years in the future at ostensibly higher prices, don't we want lower prices? Like, doesn't that make sense if you're contributing every two weeks? So I was just trying to talk some sense into him. And he's telling me that people at his job are calling him stupid, saying, don't you see the risk involved? And a friend of a friend is, is texting him. And it's almost not to be, um, not to be uh, condescending, but it's almost like the blind leading the blind, how, you know, how people should invest. Well, this is the difference between the fear of missing out and now you have the fear of being in. So that's exactly where I was going, where... Oftentimes, investing is a game of implied peer pressure where you feel FOMO, but it's not because your friends are necessarily telling you you're an idiot for not owning Tesla. But now, when the market's down 20% or close to it, this is, start, this is going to start coming up in daily life where your family, your friends, and your coworker are going to be like, oh my God, I sold last week. Why didn't you sell? And the reason why that goes on is because investing, just like politics and sports, is so tribal. People don't want to be alone on an island. Yeah. It, it feels, and that's why you get this herd mentality of people make decisions that they never would make individually, but it's easier to do it in a herd. And especially when it happens this fast, it that's what makes it so scary. So so we're basically at the same losses now. We're a little, I think the S&P is down 18 or 19%. That's basically what happened in the end of 2018. And it didn't, it sure didn't feel like this. And and again, at the time, I didn't think that, I wasn't that nervous about that one because it just seemed like there was nothing, there was no reason for it. And that turned out to be the right stance. Not, not to this, brag. Th- well, every every I mean, but then then again, you never know. You never know what's setting people off and what the overreaction they're coming from or where they're starting. But here's why: a, as mentioned, obviously we have the the fear of a health pandemic, which is making this feel a lot worse. But it is worse because in December 2018, it took 56 days from the from the top to the bottom, 56 days to fall almost 20 percent. Today, it's and that only, felt fast at the time. Actually, that felt very fast. Today, it's I'm looking at the Dow. It's 17 days. So I think the SP is 13. But point and, is, and it was coming it's, from it's an all time so high. Quick. Right. It came from an all time high. That's what I think that's what's making this so just crazy to deal with. So here's the other thing. So we're back at 2754 on the SP. That brings us back to May 2019 levels. Is that that? I mean, this is context guy here that not, help, not helpful at all. What were things that bad in May 2019? By the way, A, no, and B, nobody would say that's a big deal. The thing is, people think that stocks are going to go a lot lower. And actually, Miles um, wrote a really good piece over the weekend about like the Pinkerton view of... of um, Isn't that a Weezer album? Yeah, I was just thinking, like, so wait a minute, not, not Pinkerton. Pinkerton it was a Weezer album. Steve Pinker, how he's basically just like mega context, look how much better things are. But that's such a cop-out because it doesn't change the fact that things are like really bad. So you could say... You could say that things are so much better, and you could give all the context, but it's like, well, it doesn't change the fact that this is kind of bad. So I, I said, I said this morning, the the reason that market crashes like this, and I think it's safe to call this a market crash, especially on a day like today. The reason market crashes are so hard, especially when you're in it like this, when you're down twenty percent ish, you always think that well, it's probably a little too late to sell, but it's way too early to buy. True. So then you just get stuck, and then it's like. Paralyzed. And then one thing is going to happen where we either get a snapback rally in a big day like we had last Monday, or you get another leg down, and then you react because now you feel paralyzed. I, And the thing is, I was trying to tell you this morning, this is one of the few times where I've been, I'm a little speechless, and maybe that sounds like a cliche, like a sports cliche, because if you didn't have a plan going into this, that guess what, at some point stocks are going to get hammered, and it doesn't. the reason doesn't matter then if you didn't have a plan going into this, th- there's not much help that you can get right now. No. I don't, not, no. Right? Well, I don't know that there's much that you can, you can hear that's going to make you feel better or change your stance that's going to a lot like... You can't go looking for a new source of advice right now and, and try to make things better unless you completely start over. So the S&P 500 is back to May levels or whatever you said. But that's U.S. large cap stocks. U.S. small cap stocks are now flat for the last three years. Energy stocks down for the last 15 years. So one thing that we haven't spoken about, which is even more absurd a move, way more, 
is the move in interest rates. Yes. I, and I wrote this before knowing what was happening today, and I still stand by it. I said, I'm more worried about the bond market than the stock market. Because even if stocks fall another 20% and we get this 40% crash, I'm fairly confident that the stock market is going to come back. And if in 20 or 30 years, the stock, stock market is not you know, demonstrably higher than it is today, or even <coughs> after Japan. a crash, yeah, then, then we have greater problems to worry about than... And I don't think that, that we are Japan. But that's why, longer, shorter term, the stock market is going to freak everyone out. And it probably rightly should for the moment. But I'm more longer term worried about... Would you say it's a voting machine? Only when there's blood in the streets. How much does the blood weigh? So interest rates have just collapsed. If you look at the the rates, and I put a chart in this in my piece about... I, I looked at 30, 20, 10, 5, 7, 2. Those rates are all now below where the Fed fund target is. So the Fed has their short-term rate at 1 to 1.25. And I'm, I'm waiting for it to happen. Maybe they're going to be patient with this. But when does the Fed come in with a bazooka? Are we talking... A hundred basis point rate cut, or are we talking like, what about fiscal policy? Yeah. I think what if the Fed realizes we're, in, and I think that's what happened in the crisis too. The Fed realizes we're in on this on our own because the government can't get their act together and put together a comprehensive fiscal policy statement. So we're gonna have to pick up the slack, and we're gonna cut cut rates seventy five or hundred basis points again. Just and, and honestly, the bond market is forcing them to do it. What what would that do? Nothing probably, but people who are bl- trying to blame the Fed. They're using the tools at their disposal to do what they can, but it's not up to them to put together a fiscal stimulus package like the government should be doing. That right. That's not their job. So they're doing everything they can. But but the market is forcing yields down as people are, are moving into, into bonds for safety, and bonds are acting as a diversifier as they should. People have been worried for years that the bond market is going to blow up, and we have this bond bubble. And I tweeted last night that Alan Greenspan called a bond bubble in 2017, when ten-year Treasury was at 2.3 percent, I think it got as low as 0.35 percent today or last night. And, and so, if we're using the irrational exuberance speech that he did in 1996, and stocks didn't bottom to, or didn't top out till 2000, I think we still probably have a couple years in the bond. But I thought this could happen, maybe in like two or three years. I predicted last week that we're going to get negative interest rates. I didn't think it was going to happen this year. And it, if this continues, we might get negative interest rates this year. It's it's a possibility. And I think longer term, this is going to be a huge, huge issue for retirees, for pension Pensions. plans, for insurance companies. The, and these these rates, it's not like they're all of a sudden going to snap back. It, obviously, the, the move could move higher. But even if, they, if interest rates doubled from here and then doubled again, we're talking about 1% rates or something. The, we've never been in a situation like this before. Where interest rates are so low, this is, I, I'm. This is one of the things that I'm probably most worried about long term for a huge number of people. I think this is going to be a real problem. I completely agree. And right now, everybody's worried about the stock market, but I think you're right. The bond market is the place that we really should be worried about because, unlike stocks, which have four thousand variables, um, some of them known, the, the most important ones unknown. With bonds, it's really just simple arithmetic. Like the starting yield is is the single biggest predictor by far of what you're actually going to get over the over the life of the bond. Um, but this move is just right, we know what we basically know what long term bond returns are going to be. Yes, nothing. You, it's it's impossible to guess in the stock market with bonds. We kind of know, and so from here, th- returns are going to be awful for a long time. Bloomberg had a post showing that over the last call it year and a half. Long bonds have had better risk-adjusted returns than every stock in the S and P 500. This is a truly a stunning <laughs> oh, move, and this is this is the one time in recent memory. You know, there's this old adage. Maybe it's gone. Like I forget who says this. When everybody is on one side of the boat, like I feel like out of everything, everybody, everybody was short in your duration, and it made sense. Like it made a lot of sense, and the exact opposite thing happened. It's truly a stunning move this is this is the most impressive bull market of all time i'm i'm calling that now the bond we've been in a 40-year bull market and then they hit two percent and 1.3 percent and people say okay this is it and it is i i don't even so there was a story in the wall street journal saying that well a lot of the decline comes from people having to hedge and a lot of the banks have to hedge out a lot of their the securities they're creating and the mortgages they're creating they have to they have to buy treasuries to hedge out 
I don't think you can you can account this this fallen rates to that. Be, like this is just such a momentum play and such a you st- and and I'm I'm not saying that people should get out of bonds because guess what when the stock market falls the bonds still provide the best hedge that there is, right? There's no greater diversifier in your portfolio than bonds, and I, that's not going to go away just because rates are low. But there's still going to be some really tough decisions that need to be made in terms of allocating assets going forward for people who want. Think think about it. We don't need any inflation basically to totally wipe out bond returns for years. 